and my research horticultures at the UT Gardens in Jackson. My position there it covers a little bit of everything, <laughs> uh, but I'm in charge of the grounds, the gardens, and the, the research, the trials that we conduct there. So we conduct trials much as you see here in Crossville on the, on the gardens here, but we do a lot of annual plants as well as, as trees and shrubs. So uh, um, growing those plants out, uh, gathering that data, making that data available to the public, but as well as the growers that have provided those plants for us. Uh, general groundskeeping, of course the three gardens together are part of the uh, State Botanic Garden of Tennessee, so we're open to the public uh, year-round, daylight to dark. In the gardens in Jackson we do a lot of repurposing uh, things in the garden, and, and some examples of that, um, our theme a few years ago was, was reusing bottles. So we had 6,154 wine bottles uh, in the garden and so we collected those from uh, people brought them in from restaurants um, and we use those to build walls. We have a wall that's 44 feet long and 12 feet tall with a thousand bottles hanging on it in the garden. It's a permanent display. We use them to edge beds. We made bottle trees and so it was all about reusing, repurposing and, and recycling and so we've done that with bottles. Uh, one year our theme was mailboxes and call come check the mail so we took old mailboxes scattered throughout the garden. Around each mailbox we planted up um, different plants around them. There was a list in the mailbox of what you could, could be growing uh, around your mailbox. Um, this year our theme um, we kind of went through, the, it was our 25th anniversary, and so we went through uh, the, the years and kind of picked up some past themes, and so we did a lot of fun things. We had neckties in the garden, uh, which was a previous theme, so it was called um, all, tied up, all Tied Up in the Garden. So we had neckties hanging from structures, so men's neckties, and just, yeah, kind of recycling and reusing uh, things in the garden. And so found objects, things you could do at home that don't cost money, um, and so it was a lot of fun with that. We irrigate uh, at work when necessary. Uh, we don't have any automated irrigation and, and we go by, you know, what's, what's it doing outside? We look at the soil and does, does the plant need water? Is the soil dry? Is the plant wilting? Uh, and we water as needed. And so uh, for the homeowner, I think it's really important if you've got the one of those irrigation systems, you can buy a device that collects the rainfall and, you know, it will come on if it needs to. And if it's rained an inch, it's not going to come on. So uh, I feel like we waste a lot of water, um, especially in commercial and residential landscapes with, with automatic irrigation. So um, time of day is, is, um, is can be, you know, if obviously if you're a working person, you may not be able to irrigate the best time of day, but early in the morning is the best because it, this, uh, it's not so hot, you don't lose as much from evaporation. Also, if you have a, a disease problem, you have less the water staying on the foliage for a shorter amount of time. So watering in the evening, it's not quite as good, but you know, when I go home, that's when I water. You've, you know, you've got to do it when it works for yourself. But, but uh, thinking about those things, you know, time of day is important and, and if the plant actually needs it or not. Um, and then just building your soil, organic matter helps hold moisture in. So um, building that soil, adding organic matter to it uh, really helps the plant nutrient wise, but also hold moisture. So you have to, you have to irrigate less. So that, that's an important aspect of, of, of saving water as well. So if you're uh, building your beds, uh, adding whether it's vegetable garden or flowers, uh, you know, adding organic matter is great. And depending on what part of the country and even from one county to the other, your source of organic matter really may vary. If you're in West Tennessee, I mean, we have cotton gin, trash from our cotton gins, which you would not have that here. Um, but there's all sorts of forms of organic matter, whether it's um, a bagged product that you may buy, a finely ground pine bark, or uh, chicken manure, or horse manure, or cow manure, uh, just depending on what's in your, your area. You just want to be sure the product you're using is, is composted, it's well been through a heat where it's killed the seed, kills any diseases that might be in that product, but mixing that in your soil. Um, you know, if you're in, when I worked in Pennsylvania, so mushroom compost was the thing, and it was a wonderful product, and some local wastewater treatment plants make uh, compost from their biosolids, which is a wonderful product, and so there are all different forms. You just got to, you know, your local county extension agent and your master gardener program are great sources for that information that you could check out and see what, what's available in your area. There's all sorts of, of methods of composting. Uh, one of the, the more simpler forms is just building a, a structure out of wire or out of maybe even old pallets and three-sided where you put your, your plant material in there and you just let it decay. And there's, you know, there's all kinds of information out there on that. Um, you know, depending on what you have available, how much green material, how much brown material, how much moisture you're giving it, the temperature all depends how quickly it breaks down, how often you're going to turn the product. Um, but once it does decay, of course, adding that back into the garden is, is a wonderful uh, way to increase the organic matter in your soil and, and the nutrition of the soil and the microbes and all the good stuff that we need in our soil to, to make it work.
The university has three gardens, one in Knoxville, one in Crossville where we're here today, and then in Jackson. And those three climates are, are quite different, especially the west end of the state is much hotter, where here on the plateau, of course, it's cooler. Um, so different plants for different parts of the country. It's very important when you're choosing a plant to choose the right plant for your location, whether it's the, the amount of space you have or the soil you have or your climate, doing your homework. Um, you know, reading in books, reading online, but also talking to fellow gardeners is a wonderful way to learn. So if you're in Knoxville, you're in Crossroads, in Jackson, getting involved in those local organizations is a great way of learning what plant material. Go into your local garden center as opposed to the box store. Talking to that person that actually grows that plant themselves and finding out what's going to do well in your area is a good way of choosing right, right plant material. So, you know, there's plants here on the plateau that were growing full sun in my talk today, there's hydrangeas that you can grow here in full sun in West Tennessee have to have shade. So knowing your, your area is very important in choosing the right plant and sustaining that plant uh, and not having to give it additional care uh, because it's struggling in your climate. So very important choosing the right plant. A perennial is a plant that returns each year. Um, we don't, people don't think about this, but a tree is actually a perennial. It, it's here every year, even though it doesn't die to the ground. But most people, when you talk about perennials, are talking about a flowering plant that dies typically to the ground and comes back. A daylily is a wonderful example that everybody knows daylily and iris. So if you're looking to uh, put something in your garden that you don't have to replant every year, a, a perennial is a wonderful example of that. And um, depending on, again, what part of the, the country you're in, um, depending on what perennial you would use, but daylilies and iris are two that are just, they're gonna be there forever. So uh, if you don't wanna go to the effort of replanting each year, look for a perennial plant and, and it's long term. Now, if you're wanting all summer color from spring, from the time you plant it until frost, an annual is a great example of that. And, and we often don't think about this, but all of our vegetables are annuals. I mean, they you start with a seed, the tomato in the spring, and by the end of the year, you have the fruit and the plant dies. So you're replanting every year. So that's an annual. But zinnias, marigolds, they are two of the most common. The beautiful sunflowers behind us are annuals. So you do have to replant them every year. Um, but of course, the sunflower uh, benefits us in so many different ways from the seed to the, the pollinator to the beauty. Um, but again, choosing those annuals or the perennial for your part of the state. For instance, there's geraniums don't do well in the heat of West Tennessee, but they do wonderful here on the plateau. So learning that and finding out which ones uh, is, is really important. The gardens and the research and education centers across the state are, are living laboratories. And uh, my role at the university is working with ornamental plants. So we are growing plants to see how well they do in our climate. And uh, again, we're taking data on that plant material. We're seeing what is sustainable. And, you know, if a plant requires a lot of care, it's not gonna get higher marks on our, on our evaluations. And so it is a living laboratory. And those, those three gardens, the Crossville, Jackson and Knoxville are open daylight to dark for people to actually come out and see. And this varies different from your landscape. You, you may try a little bit, but you don't want to spend a lot of money on a plant and it not do well. So we're doing that for you. <laughs> so uh, yeah, what, what we have to offer our information is, is very uh, helpful to the homeowner and, and producer as well.